yoga for me personally is for me is a peace of mind i mean the definition of yoga is the union of the mind the body and the breath and i think i discovered it quite later on in my journey in life but when i did come across it for me it was being home my body and it's a different angle and a different way of accepting myself as I am and being present and just a bit more grounding because I think what the point in which I discovered it there was just so much happening and I felt it was really hard for me to keep up so for me it is just about grounding myself being present and just being within my body and my breath and what does it mean yoga for kids is it a different type of yoga or is just a kid jumping on you while you're trying to hold a pose <laughs> i'm not gonna lie it's a bit of both um but i love both elements of it um yoga for kids is similar thing it is empowering them to use their breath when they need it so um if they have big emotions what can they do and it is always to take that breath to shake off that energy um using that mindful movement and also just kind of loving themselves as they are so in the classes it is an element of all those three but in a very fun and playful way because i mean that's how we relate to children it has to be fun it has to be playful and it has to be story themed oh i love that story themed that that's pretty cool so what age what is the youngest uh uh students that you have so the youngest actually um so i only launched 2 years ago um and it was through the pandemic online and the youngest yogi i had was 20 months whoa um, the average age <laughs> and he was an absolute sweetheart i remember his name and his mom was so lovely and she do the classes with him and it was it was just so wonderful to see like as i was doing downward dog he would come into it and i as i would come into child pose he would follow it and i think it's just it's almost saying that yoga children copy right they if you set if you are a positive role model they will they will they're like sponges they will absorb all of that so yeah i mean he was 20 months he was engaging in the movement he was engaging in the dancing um some of the stories have probably gone over his head but the fact is him coming to regularly to the classes and enjoying that movement um i mean that's the reason he was still very present in the classes and it was really it's really impressive i mean he's very very young and the classes were about 45 minutes to an hour so Whoa. he was very he did very well. that's incredible imagine I- i'm thinking i discovered yoga pretty late and it was only i started practicing properly after my son was born and my back was wrecked <laughs> and i had to do something to kind of uh it was my attempt to fix my back and i think if i would have yoga since i was like 20 months old my life would have looked completely different 100% 100% and i think that is one of the biggest reasons why i went into teaching yoga to children because i think a lot of us do discover it at a much older age when we when we almost feel like really rock bottom and feel like oh my god i need something to almost pull me up but if you learn those tools and those skills those breathing techniques from a much younger age i think it definitely shapes how you perceive the world and how you perceive yourself and how maybe you cope with uh with certain issues because i think the idea of mindfulness especially as a teenager and then a grown up you know having a scattered mind and not really uh handling everything that's coming from all directions i think having this grounded kind of home base where you know that it's your breath and it's your mind and it's your body and it's all kind of connected i think growing up with this is such a is such a great gift so you discovered yoga pretty late and what made you start this whole idea of teaching yoga to kids how does that happen so it so i've always my career has always been with children um from the age of 9 i think i remember i was driving in the car with my uncle and we were driving to scotland and i was staring out the window and it's almost just a moment that kind of came to me and i said i want to work with children whether that was 
in any field, I just knew that I had a really deep connection with children um, and growing up and working and exploring those different angles. Um, I loved that working relationship with parents as well. Um, so for eight years prior, I was actually a nursery teacher. But I think working with children and having your own children was, I, I massively underestimated it. And I think mentally, physically, it was very draining. Um, I think both my birth stories were quite intense and I didn't really have a chance to overcome that. Um, so I basically took a pause and thought I need to just focus on myself. Um, and I discovered yoga, but I was missing the element of being with children. And I thought, I don't just want to kind of give up nursery life. I still want to like, I still want to work with children. So basically put my two passions of yoga and children together. And I thought, why not teach yoga to children and have fun and play games, but still empower them with all these really helpful lifelong skills, which will, I mean, will help them so much now in the future with any transitions that they might have. Um, and that's basically how that decision came about. And I just did loads of research for um, different types of schoolings and different types of qualifications I could get. Um, and then, yeah, I think in, in February, just before the pandemic, 2020, 2020, yeah, I, um, I went to Manchester for three days and qualified as a children's yoga teacher. <laughs> Where I was going to go from there, I had no idea. <laughs> I just knew that I wanted to do yoga as an everyday practice and I wanted to share the gift with children. That's all I knew in that moment in time. <laughs> I think that's enough. And you know, the best ideas are the one that almost feel like a no brainer. Well, of course you should teach yeah. yoga to kids. If you find yoga so impactful <laughs> and you love working with kids, well, it's obvious, right? But I imagine the struggle of getting there and not being certain and feeling drained and not knowing that must have been quite challenging up until that point when there is like you, this eureka moment of, well, of course. And then once you decide, you're like, okay, so what do I need? What kind of qualification? Where is my studio going to be? How am I going to find uh, other kids to work with? Do you remember the first class that you gave? Yes, very clearly. Um, yes, yeah, so it was online. Um, it was the 4th of June. Oh, wow. You really um, remember it. <laughs> yeah, I remember it very clearly. And I was so excited up until that morning. So my first class was at 10 a.m. And I was so excited. And I had the details on Instagram through family friends. And that's what were. And I think I had about 10 people signed on. And there were two people that I had to know. I didn't know who they were. Um, they were, so I'm based in London. One person was in Australia, not in Australia, sorry, in Singapore. And there was somebody in Birmingham and another person in the outskirts of London. And I just remember in the morning, I was like, oh my God, is this actually happening? I was so nervous. I almost had to basically go in the garden and take really deep breaths. I had really, really bad anxiety really bad anxiety um i've never been the type of person to almost like perform um be on stage like it's just not really me but i knew that the reason it was purely because of it felt so right in my gut and how passionate i was about it and as soon as the first student came on and the second and the third um like i just hit play my music started and I think the whole hour just flew by. I had the most fun ever. Like, it was amazing to see that. It, it, there were just, all the children were just like mirror images. I was doing one pose, the children would copy another. I really, really highly encouraged the parents to get involved because I think yoga is all about connection. So whether they did it with their sibling or their grandparent or their parent. And it was so lovely to see how many parents um, were on board as well. And I just, I remember finishing the class and I thought, wow, like whether, how, however the parents perceived it, I knew that the children were engaged, they were enjoying it, they were listening. 
and I just felt so, so proud. Whatever, again, whatever happened thereon <laughs> was a different story, but in that moment in time, I was, I knew that I could, I knew I had something, I knew I was good at something. Oh, I yeah. can, I can only imagine that feeling of seeing people joining your class, and it's not like you've been in that area it's not like how, how would somebody from singapore even know this existed i wish i knew this existed because uh, the daycares were out and i was looking for creative things to do with my son and you know after a couple of weeks you kind of run out of ideas so i wonder how yeah. how did you get the word out to be honest i think a lot of it was like word of mouth um i, I again i did it on social media and i tried to get it out but at that moment in time i think i probably only had about 70 to 100 followers did not have a big following at all um so even now to be honest a lot of my classes are through word of mouth and it is a it is a genuine following because if the product and the service is true enough then the word will spread a bit more naturally and it will just grow more authentically um and that's basically what it was and i think from then on i remember i had classes i was fully booked i had 15 children I had people waiting. I ended up doing another class. Oh, wow. um, and then it got to a point where I was doing four classes a week um, whilst homeschooling. Um, I mean, again, it was in the pandemic. So there were six of us living at home and there were four people um, who were working on the laptops, but I really needed the Wi-Fi connection. So I would say, guys, I need the Wi-Fi for the next hour. Please don't use the internet. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot too back in that moment in time. But again, like when you're really passionate and true about something, you will find a way to make work. You will pursue it, whatever whatever may come. Uh, I find that uh, a lot of the people that I that I'm talking with, they're doing a lot of work that is uh, emotionally demanding. So uh, the first interview I did with uh, Katarina listening to birth stories is pretty uh, demanding in terms of uh, how your soul <laughs> takes these stories, you know, and uh, talking to Gila about running a chocolate factory in a, in a country that is not your uh, home, not your home base. That's quite incredible. But what I've noticed is that although this work is so much harder, just going to the office and doing a nine to five, it sort of recharges you back. So it's not just draining, it's also kind of filling you up. So how would you find the energy to homeschool, do four classes in a week? How would you take care of yourself to kind of get that extra recharge? Um, that's a really good question, actually. I think I had only recently discovered how to recharge myself and how to look after myself, I think being a new mom and sometimes just getting lost in society and family, you you kind of power through. And I think a lot of people now, I mean, a lot of awareness has come up, but still people do struggle with when is it a good time to pause for yourself without it seeming selfish. But I, I think I was very, very lucky. The support network that I had with my cousins living with me and my husband, um, we all were very, very respectful of each other's space. So if I said I needed to go for a walk, I would go for an hour and a half walk. I would listen to an uh, audio book. I would listen to music. I would collect my thoughts. And I never once felt like my kids weren't okay or I was being judged. And I think in the place and the environment that that was, it, it, it made me be, become, it made me reset. And I think that's really, really important because I feel like if you don't reset, you just end up drowning. And also, I think sharing that with my children, I was very, very aware that how I look after myself and show that love for myself has to be passed down to my children as well. And again, modeling that for my girls is a very important part of being a mother of two girls. Um, and I mean, I created a nice calm corner for them because obviously during the pandemic, they it was so much information to overload. They they had a lot of anxiety. So to say that you need time out, I need time out, you need time out, it's okay. You don't need to feel guilty about it. If somebody else is doing something, that's okay. You have to listen to what works for you in that moment in time, whether that's reading, whether that's having a bath, whether that's just 
doing cloud meditation and being with nature. There's so many, uh, we explored a whole bunch of things because I think what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. And it's all about trialing and um, testing it and trialing it out. And for me, particularly, a lot of it was physical movement, um, whether it was doing a workout, going for a walk, um, doing yoga, a lot of that really helped me to put myself in a healthy mental state as well. So how old are your girls now? Now they are eight and five. Eight and five. So they were six and three when you started, sort of? They were six and three, yeah. Wow. Do you feel like uh, something changed in them since they started doing yoga? Maybe is there something that is noticeable that, well, actually, I don't know, because sometimes they just grow grow older and, and evolve. So I don't know if I can connect it to yoga. This is pretty interesting. Yeah, I see what you mean. I think um, they have a lot more awareness in terms of their emotions. Um, my little one still has very, very big emotions. Um, and she knows what she has to do that helps her. And I always ask her, I say, what can you do to help yourself? She's like, I need to breathe. Oh, that's really good. Which is really, really it's really powerful. And if it, it will always start with <sighs> like short breaths. And I'll ask her, is that helping you? And she'll say no. So then she'll close her mouth and she'll take that deep breath in through the nose and it, exhale it out through the mouth. So she is very aware that it a breathing, a certain breath work is very, very powerful for her because it helps to relax her nervous system. With my older one movement she's very she moves in a very unique way she's very flexible she's very free she's she's such a sweet and unique child and she actually launched divine yoga with me she did the classes online with me so a lot of the children whether they related to me was one thing but they really connected with Sia um and she loved it she loved that she could share this gift with other children and work with them but there are definitely times, I think she's definitely at a point where perception and um, what people say is one thing. And it's really hard for her, to, for me to say, okay, let's go and do yoga to switch off. Like, no, I don't want to do that. This is annoying me. This is bothering me. And that's okay. Um, everybody has their journey. Everybody's very different on different days. So with her, journaling really, really helps. There are journaling. a lot of times when she doesn't like so she journals quite often and I do have to encourage her, but it's basically writing down, drawing, doodling, but for her to have an outlet. And I think that's what it is, a form of outlet, whether that's punching a teddy, punching a pillow, um, writing it down, drawing it down, breathing it out, whatever that outlet is, I think it's important for children to explore it. Your level of empathy is unbelievable. This is so, Thank this you. is so incredible. Do you journal yourself? I'll be honest, I do on and off. So um, I have a six minute journal that I do three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the evening. And I think a lot of my journaling comes from a place of gratitude. So what am I grateful for? And then I think based off that, I tend to kind of waffle on whatever my thoughts are. Um, so that's my version of journaling. There are times when I do have a bit of a brain freeze and I don't know what to journal about. So um, I kind of just find some journal prompts. Um, and sometimes I'm in the mood, sometimes I'm not. But I think before I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to journal because it is quite a heavy word. Um, but now if I, if I don't want to do it, I won't. If I fancy it, then I will. I think it's about yeah, just not putting that pressure on myself, not having that expectation, um, which allows me to do it more freely. Oh, I like that. It's just like pausing without feeling guilty is also giving yourself the permission to uh, do whatever feels right at that moment. I feel that this yes. is something I had to learn. <laughs> I'm still, yeah. I'm still learning. I'm, I'm getting better at this, but I'm still learning. When you do journal, do you have some sort of a, like a formula to get yourself going? Do you write the date or the time or where you're sitting or what are you drinking or something like that? 
I like to write the date because um, I find that if I read back even a week ago, my this my state of being is just very different to how I am the following week. Like it's really really interesting, and I look back and that's parts of it will be like, oh my god that is so cringe that I wrote that. I can't believe I wrote that, but I in a it's almost funny, but I'm trying to do it in a very non-judgmental way. But it's really hard. But it's fine. It's my thoughts. It's my journal. It's okay. Um, I don't really have a process, but like I was saying, if I start with the three things that I'm grateful for, and based off that, um, th things tend to spiral. Um, yeah, I mean, there are times when I tend to talk a lot of the heavier things, the things that are holding me back, or things I'm proud of and I've let go. Um, but I think I try and focus a, more on the positive when I do journal only because I feel like when I write something that's really heavy, I need to sit for me, sitting and writing isn't helpful. Moving in my body and thinking those thoughts is a bit more helpful um, in, terms of, in terms of resolving that rather than just sitting on it, if that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. And do you write it with like a pen and paper or do you do it on your phone? How does it work? I, I, I love my pen and paper. <laughs> I love the putting pen to paper. I'm, when I read a book, I take notes on my phone because it's just convenient. But when I'm writing notes or writing a to-do list, I'm very much into pen and paper. Oh, I love that. Definitely. There is this great book called, I think, The Artist's Way. And I think when I read this, I was always kind of writing, but that turned it into a certain uh, system. And what the author, I think it's like, he, it had like a 25 year uh, anniversary or something uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago. And what the author says is whatever it is that you, whatever you're writing, you shouldn't look at it for at least like two years because it's like a brain dump, you know? So when you say that you read this and you don't understand who wrote this, I remember I used to write a letter to my future self, which is like a fun, fun kind of thing. And I've been reading this as like, oh, she was so clever. Who is this person? Because I remember none of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting you said that, actually. I, um, I asked one of my yogis to do that. I asked her to write a letter to herself in six months time. And it's really interesting how much, I mean, I'm trying to encourage her to journal. And it is bit proved to be quite a challenge, but um, it was really interesting. Her thought processes, like she knew what she wanted to write, but she didn't know how to articulate it. Um, and I think it's a really, um, I think it's a really powerful act to do actually to write a letter to your future self, um, or and, and even to your younger self. How would you do things differently? Um, yeah. Oh, that. this is so nice. There was a thread once in this uh, women's group. It's like mothers that have great sense of humor. And they started this thread. If you could go back in time, back to when you were like 19, and you get to say only three words to your younger self, <laughs> what would that be? Oh, that is a big one, isn't it? Yeah, you can have only three words and then you puff, you disappear. I think be true to yourself. Not three words but i think at growing up especially at that peak moment when there's media upcoming there's a lot more like technology like from back in the days we had msn and like phones so much noise so you kind of forget to form a solid foundation of your identity um, and then even when you go through un university you kind of I mean, for myself, I kind of became a blend of different people. I like this person and I like this activity and I like this hobby. But it's really, yeah, I think trying to really pause and figure out who it is that you want to be, whether that's different, whether that's unique to yourself, like it's completely okay. Um, and then long long term, you'll just love yourself, think, I think, so much more. So I wish I would say that to myself. Do you know what you would have said? Yeah, buy Apple stock. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> I think whatever I would tell my younger self 
um, it's not about not knowing because we all know what we're supposed to be doing, right? We all know how to cope with certain things. It's just, we just don't listen. I wonder if whatever I would say to my younger self would actually register. Because, you know, it's not like when I was 20, I didn't know these things. And then if I would hear myself say it, I was like, oh, yeah, obviously. But, and then, you know, you get all the excuses why, well, you don't know, you don't know what's happening. You don't know what I'm dealing with and, and whatever. So I wonder if it's not knowing what we're supposed to be doing. I don't know. It, it's quite, uh, because I would always like tell myself, like, uh, listen to yourself, be true to yourself. But hearing this at the age of 19 or 20 would feel almost like condescending, you know? Well, what does that even yeah. mean? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think it's without those, it's that journey that you go on, you'll be able to make your own mistakes to then overcome and be who you are, be who we are now. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, we don't have to make your own mistakes, regardless of whatever advice we take from other people. Even now, to be honest, like my husband will say one thing. He's like, oh, I really highly advise you do this. And I'm like, yeah, I know that's the right thing to do, but I'm just going to do my own thing. anyway. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And then after a while, I would say, oh, you know, actually, you were right. Or, yeah. you know, and then he was like, well, I told you, you're wasting time. I was like, I'm not wasting time. This is just my journey. This is what it takes, you know, it, it, that, and that's, uh, and that's okay. Like, I've and it's really interesting to have to share that with our children as well. Because as much as parents, as much as we want to guide them and be there for them, actually, we need to just be okay with telling them, go make your mistakes and see what you do and it's okay to make a mistake and this is our number one like saying in our house go make your mistakes and it's completely okay but what can you learn from them for next time because if you're making the same mistakes again and again and again something's not right but if you're learning from that and then trying it again then it's making you a stronger a better person um but my younger one unfortunately she's like she's very very afraid of making mistakes like even when she's drawing if she you has a rubber butt nearby it, oh it's it's a whole it's a whole like episode with her it's really hard to try and articulate that as a parent i think because we do want to look after them we do want to make sure that we kind of wrap them up in cotton wool but we have to just let them be there we have to just let them out in the world but still hold on to them <laughs> Absolutely. And I think there is also like a, a gap, what I've noticed anyway, between the theory of parenting and actually applying that theory on different children, because my two kids are completely different. Like, I think if you want to be humbled as a parent, just have more than one. Because when I had only one, I was like, oh my God, I figured it out. I know exactly. Oh, it's attention and it's love and it's blah, 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 blah. And then my son uh, became, I think it was like three, that was like a proper independence. And then I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And then I would like, I would tell him, well, I don't want to, I don't want my kid to grow up, to grow up, to be like perfectionist or procrastinator. So what we're going to do, we're going to learn from mistakes. And there is no such thing as a mistake because you're learning, right? You're trying. And now you learn how, how it doesn't work, you know? So we would try these games. And then when he noticed that he can lose, he wouldn't want to play anymore. And then I discovered he's also cheating. And I'm like, what? <laughs> How does this theory work? And then my girl, she's completely different. She is still small, but it's a completely different, mm -hmm. like all my tricks, all my knowledge, nothing works, none of it. And if it worked, it worked once and then she'll learn the trick and just like, you're not fooling me again with this one. So I think it's a really humbling kind of experience of, uh, you know, applying the theory of parenting to the kids that live in the same house. I can't imagine how to do it with kids that come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different parents, different families. I don't think there is like a one size that fits all at all. No. Definitely not. Um, to be honest, I think about 
two and a half years ago, I um, I almost wanted to reset my parenting skills and reflect on them. And I thought, what can I do to learn from other parents' mistakes? <laughs> um, because I, I mean, as as you grow, you tend to you tend to like be you can hear your own mother's voice, and I very much could. And my mom was so loving, so caring, so supportive. I can see your face. Yes, yes, yes. My mom is downstairs, but, um, so yes. <laughs> this is a whole conversation in itself, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I think it's just that level of expectation. It puts so much pressure on you. And I felt that a lot. And from as from a parent's perspective, it's because they just want you to thrive and be the best that you can but actually it can be it can just weigh you down so much and i and i didn't want that for my eldest for my eldest especially because like i was saying she's very free-spirited she's very live in the moment um and i didn't want to take that away from her um she's in year three going into year four and the pressures of school, the pressures of friendships, all of that was naturally going to weigh her down. And I didn't want to add to that. I wanted to support her and uplift her to and empower her to deal with all these other pressures. So I actually um, invested in a book called How to Listen So Your Children Will Talk and How to Talk So Your Children Will Listen. Oh, that's a good title. Um, it's brilliant. I think the title in itself kind of captured me. I heard it from another podcast, actually. And it's such a, so funny because it's one of those books. I'm generally a very slow reader, but I think for the past nine months, I've basically been on the first three chapters because I'm just trying to put it into practice. And it's brilliant. It's so simple, so easy, so accessible for every parent to apply. And you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. This works really well. All you, like a lot of the techniques are just being there and saying, hmm, I hear you, not not judging what they're saying, not giving an answer, not not fixing it for them, but just listening. Say, I can see that's really upsetting you. And I thought, wow, like I can do this. And I did, and it worked really well. And then I did it for a month and it worked well. And then I have no idea what happened. My daughter turned like seven and all rules, like I had to basically <laughs> restart again. And I completely hear what you're saying that, different techniques and even language apply to different children because they're so different but it very much apply it very it very much changes depending on their age like the different stages that they go through within a year is just like massive <laughs> like just when you think you've overcome something you have to like re-educate yourself and you think oh my god which is why I'm kind of basically between the first three chapters of the book trying to like how can I reapply this now how can I take a different angle at it but um, yeah and I think it's really really important for us as parents just to ground ourselves and say actually we don't know all the answers and to say that to our children I I don't know all the answers but I'm trying really hard I am um, I told my daughter that I bought the book and that I was I'm, I'm trying to be the best mummy that I can for you and the best friend that I can for you and I showed her the title of the book and I showed her the book and she just put the book down and gave me the biggest hug. And I oh. think it is just bringing down your own ideas and not putting yourself on a pedestal and saying, actually, do you know what? I am with you on this journey. And I think it really meant a lot to her to say that actually I am trying, but parenting is hard. And she says it to me all the time. She's like, it must be really hard to be a parent with two children. And I was like, yeah, but I think it's one of the most wonderful feelings I've ever had in my life. And I think for her to see that at such a young age, you just think whatever whatever method you take forward as a parent, that for her to listen and acknowledge that I'm trying is in itself a win because she's so, for a young person, she's very, very empathetic. Um, so yeah, I think it's just kind of connecting with your children to say, I don't know the answers, I can help, I'm trying, let's figure it out together because it's very new for both of us. Absolutely. And I love that kind of vulnerability because um, I think um, 
looking at my parents and look at my uh, uh, friends' parents, they were always the authority. Like they know, they know. Even if they don't know, they say they know. So th- th- this is the attitude. So they're the go-to person. They're, they're my Google before Google existed. And you go to them for any solution. They're going to fix anything for me. And then I know that there is something I can really rely on. And they just know. And then at a certain age, you kind of start to question, do they know though? <laughs> but because other people know something else. And then you're kind of, wait, I, I need to figure, figure this whole thing out. So I imagine with my kids, I just say that I honestly, let's try this because I don't know. Let's try this one. Even if I know that it doesn't work, you know? Definitely. The whole idea of modeling, you know, because I think, uh, they never do what we say, <laughs> like never. <laughs> and they always you copy do. what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is the way forward, isn't it? Why would you just listen to words? It doesn't mean anything. And going back to what we're saying about journaling as well, when um, when they take their journals out, instead of me, it's kind of, there are times when, I, when I'm in my own space, but I bring my journal and I do it with them. And and I think, do you know what? This is really nice. Like we're in a safe space together. And if we can create that, why not? There are times when we want to be alone in our bed, but if we can do that together, it's such an, again, it is that modeling that I like journaling. And how does it make you feel when you journal? Like, um, it makes me feel like it's a nice way to reflect on the day. It's a nice way to talk about it. It's, it's anything that has been going on in your mind that feels unresolved. Let's Let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. And then when you go to sleep at the end of the day, it's such a lovely way to kind of feel, I've had a good day. Like, you know, not taking any unresolved issues into bed with you. And I'm a big believer that if I I would never go to sleep on a fight or I'd never go to sleep like upset about anything and try my hardest, whether it's to write it down, to talk it out. Um, And I think with the little ones, a lot of the time, they're so happy. They try and cling on to anything positive and as much as quickly as they can but sometimes the heavy things are things that are really bothering them they are very good at kind of just putting it under the rug not intentionally but because it gets forgotten about so allowing them that space and the opportunity to bring it to the surface again I think it's really really important for us and for them you know what I have right here because we don't have a video for the podcast but Yay. I'm holding, oh, I'm holding these amazing Yogi Power cards. And this is actually how I got to know you because I was looking um, for something to do with my son and yoga. He watched me doing uh, yoga and he would also kind of uh, imitate and he would uh, uh, show me, look what I can do. And he would get so, uh, so proud. And um and I wanted to do it in a proper way because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing it right. I, I'm taking uh, classes and I did it a lot before the pandemic. During the pandemic, there was a huge break and it was uh, it was really damaging to my whole kind of routine, you know? And doing yoga at home uh, with, uh, um, with a two-year-old that is out of uh, daycare, it was pretty, pretty challenging. But I decided this is what I'm doing. This is how I do it. And he really got into it. So that was pretty cool. And then I saw that you're creating, that you created these amazing cards with different poses. And I reached out to you and I said, hey, tell me more. How, how do we do this? How do I use these cards? What age? What order? How does this work? <laughs> Yeah, so Yogi Power is our lockdown baby. So me and my sister-in-law, Neha, um, she's a creative mind behind creating Yogi Power and I'm the yoga aspect to the table. And I think for both of us, it was very much about creating mindful tools that we as parents can use with our children, for our children. And I think we were, so again, like I said, I, I teach yoga to children and I had some other props but there were just no yoga cards that I could connect with and children could connect with because either the characters weren't relative enough or relatable enough, or the poses just weren't, the graph, the illustrations weren't very clear. And I think we just wanted something that was very, just very fun, very simple, 
but also playful. And I think we wanted a different element of that. So we've tried to go with the angle that children can do it themselves. Um, they can play the cards separately and families can do it together because the whole essence of Yogi Power is based on family connection, play and the holistic well-being aspect of it. So yeah, we've done it in a, with the mindset that the, the illustrations itself, I mean, children from the age of two look at it and instinctively come into the yoga pose. And I feel like a yoga card can do that. <laughs> but I think ultimately why, for me personally, I wanted to take this forward is because I was being, I was able to see the positive impact that yoga was having on children. And when I had launched my classes in person, there was no way I was going to be able to reach people outside of London. And I thought, what, what can we do to get a bit of yoga, a bit of mindfulness, a bit of that family connection, movement, breath work, all of these wonderful elements into other households and Yogi Power was on. So that was basically, it, it was an extension of the yoga classes that we were doing to to reach different households. I love that. You know, I've seen uh, different yoga cards and I feel that these yoga cards for kids were not really meant for kids. Um, they mm -hmm. look really nice. Like um, uh, the box is really fancy and the pose is there. But when I show it to my son, he doesn't he doesn't connect with it. He looks at it as like, mm, yeah, okay, whatever. So it feels like one of these things that are working great in theory, but if he's not doing the poses, it doesn't really work. So what you've done with these cards is pretty interesting because you created different characters. Yes, we've created 10 wonderfully diverse, inclusive characters. And the idea behind all of them is that they have their own personality. They are very quirky, they're very unique. Um, they are basically every child out there. One of them loves collecting Pokemon cards. One of them loves performing on stage. One of them loves reading to their siblings. And the idea is that each child will connect with one of these characters and see themselves in them and say that actually I can be one of these characters. This can empower me to be whoever I want to be and be proud of that. Um, and with the games, with the game spot comes a little booklet of what the story behind each character is and how Yogi Power helps them in their everyday life as well. And I think that was one of like that was one of the reasons why the character was such a big and important part of Yogi Power because it wasn't just about the yoga and the movement; it was about connecting with the child. Very important. We had a really lucky coincidence that one of the characters' name is my son's name. <laughs> hey, hi. <laughs> so he got connected instantly. So that was that was really cool. But besides the pose, so if I look at the card, I see the name of the pose. I see uh, a really lovely child uh and there is a huge diversity and they're they're really you can see the characters kind of shine through and they're all kind of full of light which is really uh, uh lovely uh so you see the uh the character doing the pose and then you have the steps of coming into the pose how to do it but then also you have like an affirmation uh sentences connected to each card can you tell me more about that the idea behind designing the card, because we had so many different versions of it. Ultimately on the card, you've got a yoga pose. You've got how to get into the pose, like you said, a positive affirmation. And underneath there's an extended additional afterthought. And the idea behind it is that the card and the game grows with the child. So from as young as two, the children can look at the tip visually and they will come into the pose. As they grow older, maybe about four or five, they can say the affirmation whilst in the pose. So they have the mind body connection. So we've done it with the intention so that the positive affirmation aligns with the body as well. And then maybe when they're a bit older, they can focus a bit more on their positioning of their arms, their knees, their legs, their hips. So a bit more 
um, that their pose is in the correct form. And that's by following the four instructions going around the yoga pose. And then the extended afterthought is when you're doing yoga, it is about connecting with your body, with your mind. But the extended afterthought is about is beyond that. How are you connecting with the world? How are you connecting with people around you, with your community? So the idea around it is you start off looking at it visually and then working on it, playing with it, exploring it. So that actually, when you have created that light within you through yoga, through the breath work, through the mindfulness, you shine it out. You shine that light out to the people around you. You created a product you wish you could buy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I think I think this is we, the best thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, a lot of hard work, a lot of um, design work went into this because. Um, the name of the poses, we had to kind of rename a lot of them so that they could be personified and created into a game. Um, so there's a lot of storytelling games. There's um, And once you like pick a few cards, you can create your own story. And again, it's so lovely because it allows a child to be as crazy, as unique, and just dive into their imagination, but still connect, coming back to it and connecting it with their body. Um, so we did it. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole range of different games to play with yogi power from your mind to imagination to drawing, very sensory based um, in small groups. And in the top right hand corner of the yoga card, you can see that there's a, either one yogi or two yogis. And that's basically what we did, what we would like as parents and as adults is that if you want, you can separate the deck so that children can play by themselves and that the poses are a bit more on the easier element and that there's no injuries. And then the other one with two yogis is where we would advise adult supervision. Oh, that is so amazing. And I love the idea of the cards are growing with the kids because I think your body is really changing and your perception of yoga really changes. And it's just something that you carry with you uh, to help yourself in certain situations. It's like, uh, I think we have a lot of these uh, automatic reactions. So when something happens, we don't even think about and we do something. So if you watch like uh, uh, Bridget Jones's uh, diary, then it's like, I go to the chocolate, I go to the sweets. For some people, they go for a run. For other people, they go and do like different things. And this is kind of interesting because you're always connecting that uh, condition to the breath so first of all just take a deep breath Let, let's mm -hmm. clear the mind <laughs> let's take a breath let's pause rather than kind of engaging in this whole thing and then what can you do like I know that when my mind is very busy and I can't concentrate I can't focus I'll do the the tree pose because if I can't focus and if I can't clear my mind, I'm going to fall down. So I do the same with my son when he's going like crazy, especially in the afternoon, I would challenge him to go and just stand like on one foot and look, look how high can mommy put her leg. And then he tries to imitate. And then it becomes like, instead of like a conflict, because with a four-year-old, you can't avoid conflicts. It just happens. <laughs> and there is no point just, you know, trying to, to avoid and, you know. So you try to, to kind of connect it to the breath and then connect it to some kind of movement to, how do you call it? Uh, um, when you all remove like weapons, you know, put them on the side and then create like truce and then uh, sit for a second. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I feel like he really needs to to win you know he needs to show me who's the boss and he will decide and he doesn't want this and he doesn't want that and honestly yeah okay that, that's fine but let's focus on something else and then we'll go back to it and then we'll kind of reason reason through it and i love these cards because um uh, this summer we're going to switch houses with another family so we're going to live in somebody else's house for a month and they will live in our house for a month because uh, I think it's going to be like a very interesting adventure of just you know avoiding immigration and looking for a job and looking for a fridge and just kind of coming into a ready-made 
a home that has kids in it already. And it's a different country, it's a different climate, the, the sound of the birds is, is different. And I'm thinking, what are the activities that we can do together? And immediately I thought of your cards because that would be like the perfect adventure of kind of doing it. And I wonder how, when my girl is gonna be a bit older, how my son is gonna be teaching her all these things. Did you notice this with your yeah. girls? Very much, very much so. Um, because my eldest did the classes with me and um, especially the yoga element, she felt a lot more confident in um, sharing techniques and poses with older children. When my little one started doing the classes with me as well, I felt like I didn't need to really guide her as much because she took a lot of that from her older sister. Um, it wasn't just from yoga, I think it was a lot of things, like she definitely not necessarily seeks her approval, but she just definitely needs her sister's guidance. Um, and there are times when I thought that Sia, my eldest, was almost smothering and overpowering her. But actually, my youngest, Anaya, she she never saw it like that. She saw it very much as um, caring for her and nurturing her. And it was really interesting because I think sisterhood, I, I don't have a sister, so I don't no, in that sense, I'm lucky enough that I've got beautiful, really close um, sister-in-laws, but the two sisterly bond, they can see something and they have something that nobody else can see. So from, even though I'm their mom, I thought she was being really overpowering, but actually no, like she knows how to deal with it. And there are times when Sia will be like, it's okay, mommy, I'll, I'll deal with it. And even whether, whether that's like, that giving her a shower or taking her clothes out like she will model that behavior so that my little one can follow in her footsteps and it's amazing because i feel like a lot of the time i can just sit back and watch and sometimes i feel like she's just parenting her and just i don't really need to do much and i think it's really nice because there are definitely times when you feel like when you learn something you want to put it into practice so for Sia, she's learned things and a good way for her to understand it better is by putting it into practice and teaching her younger, her younger sister. Um, so yeah, really, really amazing to see how they have their connection and whether that's in a playful way, sometimes they can be quite strict with one another. Um, I mean, sisters are as hell, but I mean, that bond is just, it's just beautiful for me to sit back and just observe how they connect through yoga, through play, through even their connection through an argument is so fascinating to watch. So fascinating. And it's such it's so beautiful. Like I love it. I love, love, love watching them grow day by day. And it kind of makes sense. You know, I noticed that my girl, she stood up much quicker than uh, when my son was her age. And she's really kind of excited about walking and she's babbling a lot. And um, it makes sense that if there is a, a slightly older child, they kind of want to imitate them way quicker. So if that older child is also into yoga or doing, I don't know, martial arts or whatever, whatever their passion is, or maybe all of it together, you know, I think it has a great impact on the younger sibling because it's almost reinforcing like, oh yeah, so this is what we're doing because this is so cool. It's really interesting. And I think sometimes when they can be really close, it's really hard to find the fine line between using your elder sibling as inspiration or becoming them. So a lot of the time I'm having to kind of encourage Anaya, if like even for breakfast, she's like, what? Um, we, she calls her Didi, which is older sister in Hindi. She's like, what's Didi having? And I'll say, it doesn't. it's okay what she's having. What would you like? So a lot of her decisions are based on what her sibling wants. Um, but it's, again, trying to find that balance. Like, it's okay to want something different, be your own person. But a lot of the time, I think they just have to figure that out themselves. <laughs> no matter how much you're trying to encourage them. No. <laughs> Absolutely no shortcuts. I think this is how we learn. Like the first step would be to imitate completely, you know, also like I find it with recipes, if I'm making something, 
The first time I would follow the recipe completely, then I would kind of start playing around with it. And then I would create like my own thing. And I think maybe it's like trying on personalities and trying on different things, especially with parents. At first, you kind of look at the dad, you look at the mom, you kind of model that, and then you start to look for your own kind of way. And I think it's really, it's really cool. And I think what you did with the cards is really unusual. And it's so beneficial to, to anybody. And I like the the age uh, group that you put here. It's until three, between three and 103. That's uh, that's really kind of uh, specific. And I think it's so cool. It's so cool. I look at the different characters and they're incredibly likable. And maybe my son, he doesn't, he can't read everything that is uh, kind of there, he, but he can recognize like letters and he can kind of uh, ask me, what does it say here? So there is like a curiosity uh, element to it. And I think the affirmation, I think they're really helpful for me, first of all. Yeah. I don't know how much it helps uh, them, but I think if it helps me, then somehow it helps them as well. Because it's like, I'm looking at the, I'm just, choosing one in random and I'm looking at the triangle pose and then uh, the, the sentence that uh, is under the pose is I'm honest and trustworthy. It's important to speak the truth and do the right thing even when nobody's looking. Damn, you know? <laughs> and you have 50 of these flashcards. Can, can you walk me through the creative process? Like I'm sure you had to cut out so much Oh my gosh, it was crazy. Again, because this was during um, COVID, we, I think a lot of our parent, our own parenting skills came into this, like what, what issues were we having with our own children? What was a productive way of how we were dealing with it? So I think me and Neha, we, I think a lot of it was based on our friendship and how we kind of turned to each other for how can we share with other parents powerful phrases and powerful affirmations that they could relate to um and it's not about saying don't lie it's not about um don't hide this from you you're not being true to yourself all of these things but actually how can we say it in a very constructive and positive light so we actually changed those affirmations around hundreds and hundreds of times because we were very conscious not to use not to use any negative connotations so i'm not going to do this or i um i don't want this and we tried to always twist it in a positive light and i think the thing with positive affirmations and there's so much research behind it the more you say something convincingly it will be you will become that and that is where, where it came from. So, yeah, we, we tried to align each affirmation with the pose. We went through it hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, we reworded it. We printed them all out, realized there were still some errors. We were up on several nights until two o'clock in the morning, then having to wake up early the next day um, for homeschooling. Then we shared it with our families, like, what do you think of this? Um, and there were different elements of the affirmations I think we really wanted to cover. So certain aspects, like um, reaching children that were a bit older, um, focusing more on their body image and self-respect in terms of how they accept their body as it is. And I think that was that for me was a really important aspect because I was teaching teenagers and I thought, you know what, if that can be brought to light at a younger age, I think it's really powerful but how to word that was really tricky um and saying that it's my body i respect my body and it's almost saying that we don't want uh, i i don't want other people near my body and it's my choice um and it's yes yeah, so i think trying to say it in a way that's empowering for yourself was really hard to do but really once we learned that process i think it was the biggest sigh for us. And I think we were really, really proud because each word mattered so much. It, it, yeah, I can't express how, how important that whole process was. It definitely started off with very um, simple affirmations like I am beautiful, I am a good person, I 
can be good but i think if we wanted to add a little bit more something that gave a bit of a different twist to other affirmations so that it was a bit more relatable for the child yeah and coming up with 50 wow that's uh that's that's pretty hard. I think that's like a, from a copywriting perspective, I think it's a nightmare because you have only one sentence that needs to convey everything, you know, and then you have 50 of them and you don't want them clashing and you want them kind of adding one to the other and then creating this whole uh, giant universe of different emotions and different affirmations connected to the characters, connected to the poses, connected to the visual part of it. I think it's quite, it's, it, I look at it and I see a real labor of love. This is just amazing. So you get these cards, the first printed edition, errors free, everything is perfect. And you show them to your girls. It was unreal they i think because they were a big big part of our journey when um the characters were created they saw the pencil sketch to the physical product actually only last week i took them into the shop and they saw the product in the shop and i've got a recording of how they responded to it so i think they have been there with us throughout the whole journey even to giving personalities to the characters I don't know how to explain it actually. It was children are girls, and for them to want a my mom did this, my auntie created this. Like it was a it was a love from our own family put into this deck of cards, into this game, into every single word that was written in it, with the intention that the love is shared with all the other families out there. And I think the biggest reasoning behind putting so much love and effort into it is because we know how hard it can be to raise children and to bring harmony in that home and to feel that peace within and a lot of parents want that mindfulness they want that yoga they want they want that contentment within their home but so many people don't know where to begin and i think we created yogi power so that it was fun easy and engaging and it didn't have to be a heavy load, like you don't have to read a bunch of instructions. Um, on the first page, we said, if you don't want to play the game, that is OK, but don't hide the cards in the box. Let them out. Let your children explore with them, hide them in different places. Let them do a treasure hunt. Um, but actually just making them visible for your children is the easiest way you can incorporate mindfulness within your day daily life whether it's a moment or whether it's an hour like don't be afraid to try and i think that's the thing if you don't have that yoga experience behind you if you don't have those expect expertise you're so parents are so scared of getting it wrong and i completely relate to that but actually just do it jo start that journey with them there is no going wrong i think that's the biggest advice I can give. Whether you have a pack of yogi cards, whether you put on a video on TV, whether you just Google some images, just move with your body, trust your instincts, go with it, do it with the child. Don't be afraid and just enjoy the process. What you do to one day will be different to another. As long as you're having fun and your child is engaging, you're on the right path. I remember when I first got into yoga, I will never forget my teacher who was this incredible lady who besides teaching the, the poses, she would have like a theme for every, every lesson. And she would give like different possibilities that you don't kind of strain yourself. And she would always say that if you didn't manage to do something, tomorrow is another day. And she would always use these sentences that would make me feel, uh, because my body was really broken. <laughs> so I couldn't do a lot of like really basic kind of things. And she made me feel that it's okay. This week, maybe you couldn't do it. And that's okay. Next week, for sure, you can do something else. And it was like a really kind of the support that I, I feel like I needed more than just the poses, you know? Uh, do you remember who, uh, if there was a person that was kind of important uh, for your journey in discovering yoga? I discovered yoga through hot yoga which is a very different element of yoga. Um, and it's in a heated room, about 40 degrees plus for those who aren't aware. And 
it was amazing because I think it definitely gave me the buzz. But after overcoming hot yoga, I um, this was in a local studio, I took part in some of their other classes, which was like vinyasa flow and restorative yoga. And I actually did therapeutic of issues with my knees, my hips were disaligned after my pregnancy. So for me, as much as a mental recovery, it was very much physical as well. So there was a yoga teacher um, who did all these other classes there and his name was Carl Anderson. And the, I think the reason I connected with him so much throughout it is because he made it fun. He made it so uplifting and light. Whereas when I first went into the classes, all I thought was, oh my God, I'm 30 and I am not able to do half of this stuff. Look at this 50 year old woman. Look at the way they're moving. <laughs> look at me. Look at that. Oh my God, I can't. Do like, honestly, and it, I was so, I was judging myself so much. And that is, I mean, it's really hard, but yoga is a very non judgmental practice if you allow it to be. Yoga is a practice for you and yourself only, but it can be really hard when there are other people in there who are a bit more flexible. Um, but what I loved about him is that he was you get into a pose and he would be like, cheese, smile, and actually that's all it was, just by smiling. I, my body relaxed so much and I, my, I, I could physically feel my heart shining and I thought, oh my God, like, why am I taking this so seriously? So I think, yeah, I mean, just that definitely made me enjoy yoga a lot more just to be kinder to myself and smile throughout the practice. Because I think when you're in a pose and it's really ch challenging, you're like, yes, I'm doing it. It's, I'm doing it. I'm balancing. But are you able to do it whilst you're smiling? And then when you are, you're like, I've nailed it. Like, I think, yeah, smiling was, it was so simple what he would say, but it would definitely just make me connect and remember those lessons so much more. That's fantastic. So where can, um... Where can we find you? Um, in terms of classes or Yogi Power? In terms of classes, in ter well, I'm, I'm in Rotterdam. So for me, it's a bit difficult, but I'm sure there are people who listen uh, and they are based in London. <laughs> so how can I find both? I am, um, so I do my classes in Northwest London. The name of my, so you can find me on Divine Yoga, at Divine Yoga 143 um, on social media and um yeah so i run classes in the local schools and in the local nurseries um and i run some of my own private classes family classes teenage classes whoever would like some classes but um it's really interesting so many adults are asking do you run adults uh, classes for adults and i'm not quite there yet i think for, at the moment i connect so well with children and there's not that many children yoga teachers out there at all but um, if you are lucky enough to have one in your local area, just try out a class. Honestly, your, your child will tell you whether they enjoy the lesson or not. Um, so yeah, just definitely test it out. And I think it's, it's very much about seeing it as any other curriculum, extracurriculum class. Like when they first do a dance lesson or when they first do a karate, like what's their feedback? Do they enjoy it? Are they connecting with the teacher? But the only difference is that with yoga, um, the progression might be a bit slower because these are lifelong skills which they are embedding as a foundation for decades to come so as long as they're enjoying that connection with the teacher and maybe you could even continue at home if you're doing the classes i'd highly recommend it based off a lot of the parents feedback it's i'm really proud of the impact it is having on the children so, yeah. I think through the children, you also bring it into the house, you know, so sometimes we're so busy and we're always working and there is nothing, you know, and suddenly I see my son kind of rolling out <laughs> the mat <laughs> and start to do poses and I'm like, oh my God, you're so right. And my back is so stiff. Maybe I should definitely do it. So we turn this into like a game and it's really, uh, he kind of brings it back to me, you know, like reminds me when I'm forgetting. So this is really, this is really cool. Exactly. And I do that a lot, actually. So when I do a class at the end of it, I'll always say, if they've learned a new pose, I'll always say, go share it with your parents, go share it with an adult at home and see if they can do it with you. 
And if they can't, maybe you can help them. And I, I'll always give them an element of whether it's breath work, movement, a story that they can take back home. So again, it is about connecting because I feel like if that extension of yoga isn't continued at home, I personally think doing yoga once a week or yeah, once a week just isn't enough. It is basically a class and you come back. But what, we're, what I'm trying to teach her is that these are lifelong skills and even doing five minutes every day, every other day in a playful way has benefit. So something as simple as a feather. So I bought a bunch of pink feathers um, because it's the only color I could find. <laughs> and I would ask them to put it on their hand, take a deep breath in and blow the feather. Something as simple as that is breath work. So I would then encourage the parents. Maybe you can play feather tennis. So sit opposite each other and see if you can blow the tennis, blow the feather from one side to the other. Maybe you can do it standing up. Maybe you can do it with your sibling. There's so many different ways to explore with one feather. Have a look around the house. Do you have a maybe pom pom? Maybe you can blow in water using a straw. But all these, the as much as children can exercise and practice breathing it'll just become a lot more natural to when they really, really need it. I love everything about it. And I love your energy. I can imagine that kids would be drawn to you, like, uh, you know, like flocking towards you because of this positive energy. And it doesn't mean that everything is always positive. It just means that the attention that you put towards certain things, this is what you're going to be noticing. So of course, parenting is really hard. No one has like a uh, no one has uh, like a manual, no one figured it out. No one has like the definite uh, a book that can tell you, oh yeah, this is definitely what works. For you, a certain book worked at a certain age. For another person, a podcast worked for another like exactly. five minutes and then all the cards are being reshuffled. But I think it's so wonderful that we take a moment and kind of reassess and say, well, you know, this didn't work very well. <laughs> so maybe I should try like a different approach. And I think the whole idea of starting with yoga when kids are so flexible, you know, because I can't, I can't reach my toes. And uh, for my son, it's such an achievement that he can, and he can show me like, look, mommy, I actually can do this. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is great. This is wonderful. I wish, I wish I could do it like you and you're doing it so in such a great way. And then he's super proud. And I think it's really, it's really uh, unusual and so wonderful. And I want to say a huge thank you for taking this time and uh, sharing your story. I think every person who has a body <laughs> can be doing yoga. It doesn't matter if you're flexible, you're not flexible. It's just just a few poses a day, just to center yourself and kind of uh, figure out uh, what's really important and kind of get out of the loop that you kind of sometimes get, uh, that I get stuck into. 100% <laughs> relate to that, yeah. I think it's, yoga's really helped me to open my mind and open my heart so I can try different things and just be aware that if certain things don't work, like you were saying, that's okay and I can try again. And I think to have an open mind and an open heart to take on these new challenges helps you to move forward in a more grounding way.